Hello and welcome to the show. My name's Velvet. This is Do All of the Things. And on today's episode, Chooch Chooch goes the train. Tis the story of a quite little train, specifically an HOTTCPCC. Is it PCC or PPC? No, I think it's PCC, a model TTC streetcar. Anyway, this thing belonged to my late brother and is a keepsake I acquired after the fact. And for the last little while, it's just been sitting on display in my living room. But I knew that it was some form of electrical apparatus and just having it sit there wasn't quite good enough for me. I don't have a lot of intention on it actually playing with it or doing some sort of setup, but still, I had to make it work. I had to make it do something, and that meant building a circuit, and that's something I enjoy doing sometimes. So we have here a little circuit all put together on the breadboard, and uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, more complicated than a lot of people might actually use to run a train. If it wasn't for the fact that they have like these fancy digital systems now, apparently, I don't really know much about this sort of thing. I just know what I've briefly, briefly researched online when trying to figure out somewhat how they do things before. But then I didn't really look that far into it. I just kind of came up with some of my own ideas. Ha, huh. train goes forward train goes backwards. So, we got button, button's bit lit, we press, we see green for forwards. Train, it goes forwards, we stop, we press button, red LED for backwards. Oh, now train goes backwards, right? Pretty straightforward, this is where it gets interesting. So, train is going forward, now I gotta press the button. It's like, oh, no, no, no! You cannot change direction of train while train is rolling. Oh, but what's that? Okay, pay attention here. Train goes forward, press button, we get blinky blinky, stop, oh, it switches over. Train goes backwards, press button, blinky blinky, oh, it switches over. We can preset our next direction. I thought this was a neat little trick. Like at the end of the day, it was just all about getting this thing to switch back and forth on us. Oh, bye train. Oh, high train. Oh, bye train. Oh, high train. Back that popper up. Zrump. So what's going on here? Well, uh, if you are observing, you might notice this big pupper right here. Oh, does that look like an inductor coil? Yeah, that's an inductor coil. Oh, is that PWM? Yeah, that's PWM, bud. It's definitely PWM. Oh, but I heard PWM's bad for trains, little trains. That's because some PWM motor controls depend on the motor to do the inductance instead of having an off-board inductor. And if you look, there are certain conversion kits for PWM controls that are supposed to make it more palatable for a train, and they just end end up, it's just, they add an inductor and some capacitance. They finish the PWM circuit. So right here, we essentially have a variable PWM power supply that I'm using to control the voltage going to the track. And then there's a switching circuit. Pretty much all this on this side is the switching circuit to dictate what the polarity is gonna be. And I wanted to make it a heck of a lot more interesting than just a little flicky switch going back and forth. Also, and like the idea of changing directions accidentally, you know, I kinda, I kinda had this vision in my head and I'm like okay well let's build it like that so let's get into the geekery and have me explain exactly how this circuit works so over here I have a schematic in three parts because that's how it's getting built this is the start of the process of me building this thing. You know, we're gonna start off with some voltage regulation. Got 100 UF uh, input capacitance here. Voltage regulation to 10 UF, uh, not seen here. I have a 0.1 also for the high frequency. And then we start off with a little something here called a relaxed oscillator. It seems to be as prevalent in my channel as capacitive droppers. And LEDs are to our Scottish friend. 
And this thing is our, I guess, sync clock. It's our clock that makes the switching circuit work. Now, how's the switching circuit work? Well, we have over here what is known as a dual JK flip-flop, a CD4027. I initially developed it with an HC114. It's it's the five volt version of the JK flip-flop. And I, I, I blew two of them developing this circuit because it's mixed voltages here, right? We haven't just got the five volts. We got whatever the train's running on too. And breadboard, Recording can get ultra hectic, as you can see, and you know, one wrong move, you accidentally touch two components together, and boom, you fried something. So, that's a fun time. I blew the inputs trying to signal it, but whatever. We start off at the phase button. Now, if you're familiar with a JK flip-flop, they can be used uh, to do what's known as a toggle function. So we have two outputs, Q and slash Q. That's high Q and low Q, respectively. But if I call it low Q, we're talking about low signals, high signals, we might get confused. So it's gonna be Q and slash Q. Now in its default state, you first turn it on, Q is putting out high, slash Q is putting out low. That's positive and low, respectively. Remember, logic always has an active output. It's either taking the output and attaching it to positive or attaching it to negative, high, low. So we start off with Q high, slash slash Q low, and then if we put a clock signal over here onto pin three, it flip flops them. So Q is gonna go low, slash Q is gonna go high. To trigger this action, we tie JK, the inputs, to high, and reset and set functions to low. In the uh, HC114, the five volt version, they all get tied high, but it seems that set and reset had to get tied low for it to work with the CD4027. Naturally, we have our point one U bypass on the inputs, but we're talking about the clock here, the clock input. So in order to trigger this thing to flip-flop, you can't just jolt it with a with a voltage signal. It has to be a full clock cycle, which means it has to go from low to high and back to low again, or from high to low back to high again, something to that effect. I can't remember off the top of my head whether this is positive or negative edge triggered, but the button here is basically just a clock signal, a passive clock signal. Uh, the input on the 4027 is ultra sensitive, so we had to use quite a bit of impedance to bias it. We got one meg to ground, which keeps the clock pulled low until we hit the phase button, and the 100K overcomes the one meg, pulls it up high, and then when we release the button, it drops low again. It recognizes a full clock cycle, triggers the flip-flop. Got a 220P here for debounce. I had to play with this around a lot, and this is ultimately what I had to do to get it to work reliably. Otherwise, you'd hit the button and it would go blah, 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 blah. So where do we go from there? Well, this is where it starts to get a bit confusing, even confusing for me to explain it. But Q and slash Q are directly connected to J and K of the second half of the chip. Whatever signal you put on J and K is gonna be directly mirrored to Q and slash Q, assuming you trigger the clock. Triggering the clock will take whatever's on J and K and transpose it over to Q and slash Q. See, flip-flops are traditionally memory chips. So basically, we put an input here, we signal a clock, and then it's gonna save the information, send it over here, and then even if this changes, unless a clock triggers it, it's going to hold on to the information, it's gonna hold on to that output, which is basically basically what's going on here. We press the button signaling one JK, transfers that information over to the second JK. And remember that relaxed oscillator from uh, over here? Well, through this TED K resistor right here, well, that is what is going on to the clock. So basically we manually switch this one, that transfers the information over here, and then the clock switches that one. And this is where we have the feature of it not switching unless the train is not moving because later down in the line, there's some voltage detection. It detects whether or not there's voltage on the track and that voltage holds the clock input of the second JK low via this 10K resistor, which prevents the second JK from switching over if the track is rolling. Now that's how it works on the most basic functionality. I am using that same relaxed oscillator, that same clock signal to signal the blinkiness of the LEDs when it, it reports the error which is the reason why if you look carefully you see them blink a little bit as they switch over 
Which brings us to our indicator section. We have coming off the oscillator here, a couple 10K resistors going to the gates of two and 7,000 MOSFETs. So if there's no other signal applied to those gates, that clock signal is going to strobe those gates and blink the LEDs. Yes, there are different resistor values up here than what's on here because in my actual build, I'm going to be using the, uh, the white LEDs, the bright white LEDs going through colored lenses and the green one, it's really bright, so I had to dim it down. This one needed a little bit more to penetrate the red, but we're getting distracted here. How do I explain this process? Okay, okay, let's give it a try. Okay, so what's confusing me here is knowing the default situation here when we first turn this on. Like when I turn it on, it starts off green, even though I got stuff crisscrossed here. You're gonna notice that Q and slash Q are crisscrossed, even though it's J and K, Q and slash Q, they're crisscrossed. That's done because of convenience, because of how the pinout is here. Uh, part of the pinout on the chip is K and J, not J and K. So we got the clock signal strobing the gates of the two Ed 7000s, causing these guys to blink. If no other signal is applied to them, they're gonna blink. But the idea here is the output here, say we're in forward orientation and Q is high, it's gonna send a signal through that diode to the green gate, overcoming the 10K clock signal, and it's gonna hold the green solid, indicating what direction. So the diodes coming off the output here are gonna indicate the direction. Obviously, if slash Q is low, then it can't penetrate this diode. It's not gonna do anything to the red gate. Now, assuming our phase matches in between, if Q's high and we're forward, that means J is getting a high signal. That means slash Q is high. Now, if slash Q is high, it can't send a signal through this diode and it won't affect green, but this one will. If slash Q is high, then Q is gonna be low. It can pass through this 2.2K, which can overcome the 10K, but also be overcome by uh, these ones. And then it will send a low signal to the red gate, turning off the red. Basically, these diodes on the output will signal what direction we're going in and will hold that LED solid. These ones here will uh, signal what direction that we're not going in and turn that LED off, if that makes any sense to you. Honestly, I designed this like a month ago, so it's not quite as fresh in my mind. Now in the intermediate state where uh, our clock signal's being held low and cannot toggle over, if we switch the first one, and now Q's high and slash Q is low. Well, slash Q is gonna try to pull the green gate low, but it can't because the main output here is overcoming that 2.2. Now with normal Q high, it no longer passes through this diode. Neither one of these guys are affecting this gate or LED, so that is when the clock will strobe it. I hope I explained that appropriately because it actually took me about 10 minutes of staring at the schematic to try to remember what I've done here. <laughs> we passed the design stage and now we're just in the testing and evaluation stage. And this is kind of, oh, it's hilarious, man. 10 years from now, I'm gonna look at this thing and be like, what was it doing here? You gotta go like this, like, well, oh yeah, wait, no. Oh yeah, wait, uh, mm, oh yeah, okay. I think you get the picture. So, to affect our actual direction, I'm using an older version of the schematic here, so it's not gonna be 100% representative. That phase change output now goes to what's known as an IXDD. Here is the 604 I prototyped it with. Here, I'm using 609s. But either way, they work the same, except instead of one uh, PDIP-8, we're using two SO, SO220s, SO220 slash fives, something like that. Once again, we are hacking a good old fashioned <laughs> MOSFET driver, and we're leveraging it to do what we need here because these MOSFET drivers, specifically the 609, they can handle one amp of continuous current and being in the SO220 package, we can actually dissipate that. The 604 is rated for one amp too, but that little P dip, it can't dissipate a lot of wattage. So it gets hot real quick if we try to push that much juice for it. This train only runs off 150 milliamps, so it runs five, fine off the 604, but I kind of wanted to um, scale this thing up so I could run other heavier motor loads off of it in the future if I wanted to. 
So Q's high because we're going forward. It sends a high signal to this half of the MOSFET driver. It sends a low signal to this half of the MOSFET driver. And basically these are buffers, not inverting. Whatever signal sent to them is going to reflect on the track output. So this track will get positive, that track will get negative. The MOSFET driver takes a low level logic input like that, converts it to a high current, high voltage output. The voltage input being our PWM. Fortunately, the IXDD seems to be able to run off as low as three volts, which is roughly the voltage that the train starts rolling at. We're gonna switch back to the gold schematic because it has proper what's going on here. And we go to the actual PWM itself. Uh, once again, another relaxed oscillator. This time I'm using the TC4S584. That's one of my favorite Schmidt trigger inverters to use for generating PWM signals because I like how it responds to the various capacitances. Sometimes the HC14, uh, it kind of like, oh, I'll put this cap in, it's either too high or too low. TC4 tends to hit the sweet spot. Now, of course, we're running it at five volts, so we get a consistent clock speed. We're using a 220P and a 100K linear potentiometer. And we're using this dirty trick where we just have a couple shot key diodes, SD103s. They're tiny little puppers like the 4148s. 4148s do not switch fast enough to do this with. You're just gonna end up crashing your oscillation, having all sorts of funny things happen if you try. These SD103s will. This puffer's shooting away at about 150 kilohertz. Of course, we need our point when you bypass, especially in an oscillator this fast. So basically, wherever we dial this potentiometer in, it's going to bias itself towards a particular phase dictated by these diodes, and that's gonna set our duty cycle. A real quick, dirty, easy PWM generator. Our PWM output goes to our power supply phase goes in past this 10K buffer to an IDXI MOSFET driver, an actual MOSFET driver being used for actually driving a MOSFET this time. What a novel idea. I initially spec this out for an MCP1406, but I, I ended up using a power supply that can peak out at about 20 volts for this. So the uh, MCP1406 and lots of other MOSFET drivers, they might have a limit of like 18 volts. The IDXI can handle up to 35. Now it's a dual component and I'm only using one half of it. So I, I have the other one grounded out. We have 4.7U of bypass. You have not seen an angrier component than a MOSFET driver without capacitance right on its inputs. So it takes the PWM signal, inverts it, and uses it to drive an FQU 11P06 P channel MOSFET. That is a tiny little guy hiding right in here. If you blink, you miss it. Small form factor, doesn't need to generate a lot of heat. A good efficient PWM, that might not uh, put out a lot of heat. It's rated for about 11 amps, 60 volts. I brought some of these puppers in stock because I like their specifications. Oh, sorry, I lied, nine amps. Still, plenty for what we're doing here. They have some real fast switching times as far as MOSFETs go. Oh, a little bit weak there, but that's okay. I like that they had a really low input capacitance. That's kind of important. Gate threshold, still in the two to four. And if we look at the RDS on, it's rated for 10 volts. It's not a logic level guy. So that's one reason why we're using a, a, a MOSFET driver. Just to reiterate, a MOSFET driver takes the logic level input and converts it to the full voltage to really proper control this gate. If you want a MOSFET to fire quickly and efficiently, you need, you need to just, you need to just pound that gate, but you just, it needs all the voltage. Some of them, they'll run lame as frig off just direct five volts, especially if they're trying to switch 20. We have 220U of capacitance on the power supply circuit, probably a bit overkill. And then of course, that pulses through here and that charges up this uh, 1MH inductor, this big Murata dealie right here. According to my math, dictated by the tome of knowledge by Worth Electronic, known as a practical guide for the selection of power inductors for DC, DC converters, we have step down math here. If you're unfamiliar with it, it's pretty simple. That's our ripple voltage and all these U's are V's. V in, V out, V out, V difference, 
as in VN take away V out, frequency in Hertz, I in amps, and then it spits out numbers we can work with. I've put that into this convenient calculator where our input is about 19 volts with this power supply. Our minimum output getting that train rolling is gonna be about three. And our current of this guy is only about 150 milliamps as I say, and we have 150K switching frequency. Oh, look at that. It actually wants 1200 UH or 1.2 MH. I might increase that uh, frequency. What do I got in there right now? Yeah, it's the 220P I told you about at four volts. Uh, no, no, six volts. Uh, yeah, oh, oh boy, uh, seven volts. Okay, yeah, we're gonna increase that PWM a bit. But either way, I needed a lot of UHs to chooch this guy according to my math. So that's that selection there. Of course, we have our diode going to ground because when this guy turns off and this discharges, and the other half of it needs a path to ground. And basically, you gotta remember, the inductor generates the current when the MOSFET turns off. The MOSFET turns on, supplies the voltage, it turns off, the inductor fills in that gap. And that's how we smooth out that signal. Adding that along with some output capacity I'm not too worried about how it controls this motor. There's our output track rail power. That's going to go to the output module, which uh, basically is going to be the IDX, IXDD 609s now. And this 10K right here is just, you know, it's just for discharging when we turn it off and helps stabilize things a touch along with uh, a little bit more capacitance. There's some capacitance that's not reflected here. Oh boy, I've tweaked out this circuit since I've built it. Yeah, I got a 10U ceramic across here at the moment. Maybe I should put a 0.1U. I don't know, it's about as filtered as I could get it. And then we have this right here. That's the governor. That's our engine's governor. Voltage feedback and electronics. But in here, it's a motor control. That right there is the governor and it limits our maximum speed. Good old fashioned LTV 817 opto coupler. It has an LED on one side. And what happens is when the output voltage here, we're biased to 1.2K to get to about 10 milliamps of current through this guy. This resistor is chosen based on we're trying to run an LED. So basically you, cho you choose that resistor like you're trying to run an LED and what current do you want to run that LED off of. In this case, I was shooting for 10 milliamps at 12 volts. It's going to be a little bit more at 14 volts when this actually triggers. You see that LED is going to give us about 1.2 to almost two volts of drop in this particular circuit. Doesn't always behave the same in all circuits, but that's how it behaves here. After that, we have a 12 volt Zener diode to ground. This is a ground strip right here. Oh, I don't have ground reflected here. Wow, this is a sloppy presentation, isn't it? But hey, this isn't a how-to video. It's an entertainment video. And if you have the pay grade to build this circuit, you can see past these flaws. I know you can, I believe in you. Basically, when this junction here hits 12 volts, this guy starts to conduct to ground. That lights up this LED, which fires the transistor, which grounds out the input of the IDXI and stops any more PWMing from happening. So that 12 volts plus the drop here, plus the drop here, it equates to almost 14 volts, which is what these little pupper trains are apparently rated for. So we turn this knob up full chooch. It's gonna limit the output to 14 volts. Now the only other part to explain is the enable disable circuit. I tried a couple different things. I actually tried a voltage inverter too. Uh, that's in the other schematic here. I had to use trickery with the diode and a kind of a duty cycle trickery to get the voltage sensitivity where I wanted. I found this was ultimately the better way to do it. Especially I needed a little bit of isolation from the two circuits. An AS939, sorry, Hixlexic, are we? An AS393 voltage comparator. It is an op amp with I think built-in feedback so it reacts rapidly to voltage changes and it has an open collector ground output which means there's either nothing here or it grounds it out. We got TRP, our track rail power, coming in. On one side, it goes to the inverted. On the other side, it goes to the non-inverted. So on the non-inverted side, that is our disable and our indicator light. Coming in from the five volt rail, this line right here, we have a 10K, an 8.2, a 1U, a voltage divider, setting our voltage reference. I forget what it is. I think it's like 2.75 volts because the train starts rolling at three. No, we got more ground. That's gonna be like 2.4, 2.3. Oh boy. Either way, we're setting our voltage reference. So if we give voltage reference to the inverted and it detects a lower than that voltage to the non-inverted, it grounds out the input. That does two things. It lights up the light on our bouton 
telling us that the uh, track is ready to accept a command. And it also sends a ground disable signal to the IXDD. You see the IXDD MOSFET driver has an enable disable pin. It is pulled internally high and high enables it. So if you don't put any signal on that, it's enabled by default. But if we send a disable signal, it cuts the output. The outputs go high impedance. So essentially, when we get a disable signal, it completely cuts power to the track. So instead of having like two, two and a half volts of parasitic voltage that can't actually make the train go, it disables power to the track. Which is one reason why I use the IXDD, because not only can I use it to flip flop my phases, flip flop my voltages, my polarity, I can use it as a relay to cut power to the track and the light going on tells me power is cut to the track. Now I needed a slightly different action for the clock suppression. So this guy is flipped uh, around the other way. Voltage reference is on the not inverted and our track power voltage is on the inverted. When this detects a voltage higher than reference, it's going to ground out the input, pulls the clock low, suppresses the clock so that our switching doesn't happen. And then of course, when the train stops moving and the voltage drops below reference, it releases its ground hole and our clock can happen. So you see, I needed two different things to happen here. So I used two different different halves. Also, I found that the clock signal would interfere with the disable signal. So ultimately this worked well. In the old schematic, I had a, an NPN or a 2N7000, whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm not using the, the old schematic anymore. I'm using the new schematic. So that's the circuit in a nutshell and a haywire way of explaining aiming it. I have been tinkering with this circuit for, oh boy, at least a month now, trying to iron out testing and testing and testing. And that's one reason why this presentation is just a little bit haywire. I'm in the building phase. I'm ready to build it. So it's not fresh in my mind how I designed it. So a little bit confuzzling, yeah. I know, but I got to build on it. I could probably make a little better. I could probably clean up the voltage just a little bit more, but we're at a point to diminishing gains. I got to get moving on to other projects. And I think this guy is working about as well as it can work. So I'm going to hook up the leads to the train wheels directly so it doesn't roll on us. And then, you know, hey, our pot just popped off, bud. So wheels are spinning, wheels are spinning, wheels are spinning. Seen here on electrical TV, we can see that action duty cycle at the bottom as we increase speed to the train. So doth the duty cycle. And eventually, oh, there's our voltage coming up. Ah, you can see here, it's a little bit dirty at, uh, you know, five to 600 volts of ripple. You'll be happy to know that half of that junk right there is because of some, uh, uh, something called loop inductance. Basically, cause this is just all kind of hammered together on a breadboard. We have ground loops. It is not an ideal circuit layout. So it's picking up interference. That number, those numbers are gonna come down when we actually build it into a nice circuit. Now at some point, our duty cycle maxes out and you see how it's blinking and acting weird right now? That's because our governor is kicking in. We bust out El Mitero, connected to El Outputos. Oh, look, zero voltages as expected because it's disabled. Train starts spinning at about three volts. Turn her up, 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 and then boom. I can turn her up a little bit more, but it doesn't matter, 3.4. 3.4. So remember what I said, uh, there's about 1.4 volts drop across that uh, LTV. Well, there it is. So 13.4, just a hair shy of our 14 volt target, but that's okay. We got a little bit of, little bit of hysteresis there for the safety. Don't wanna let that train go too fast, right? And if we look here on our input input, where is our input input input? input, input, input. Our input voltage is 19, no load. We're gonna bring her up. Yeah, see she goes down to about 18 volts. I initially spec this out for 12 volts, but at the end of the day, I found this nice wall ward here. It's rated for 15 volts, 900 milliamps, but it really gives me more than 15 volts. Maybe if we put a full 900 milliamps on it, it would sag down to 15. I found this in a junk box. I'm like, oh, 50 volts. I can do so much with that in a junk box to begin with because years ago, I'm like 15 volts. What am I gonna do with that? But she works. We need to build on her. And based on my timing, this is one video. So I have introduced you to the TTC PCC that I'm building an elaborate trade box for. I have explained to you poorly, but yet explained to you the circuit that I will be building. And now on a next episode, we will actually build it. Oh, you're gonna wanna stay tuned for that, bud. Yeah.
How disappointing is it that the first video of this series is the, 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 the least eventful? It's just like, oh, look at this thing. Here's how it works. Math, math, science, math, science, math. Really, it's just a rambling idiot. Just kind of like, <laughs> power goes zoom.